Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. There are two kinds of pets, the ones you choose and the ones that happen to you, writes Anne Fadiman in the March issue. Her family's pet frog, Bunky, was unquestionably the latter. Bunky couldn't learn his name, cuddle, or go outside, and lived nearly 20 years inside an aquarium on Fadiman's kitchen counter. Over that time, the family's attention and affection was taken up by other pets, dogs mostly. As she probes Bunky's small yet persistent role in her life, Fadiman reveals her unease and guilt over his long, sparse existence. Would a bigger aquarium have made him happier? Could a wild animal like Bunky ever be happy in confinement? Eschewing sentimentality, Fadiman's essay probes the ethics of pet ownership in unexpected ways. I spoke with her about writing, pets, and death. Don't worry, there's there's a little humor in there too. You know, when discussing a piece on pet ownership, it feels important to ask, what was your first childhood pet? And what, if anything, was significant about that relationship? Our first pet, my first pet, was a gray and white stray cat named Tammy. Um, adopted by the family when I was probably five, maybe six. Um, And my mother let Tammy roam around outside behind the house. There was a lot of wild land behind the house and would uh, summon Tammy with a whistle, just as if she (laughs) were a dog. And Tammy learned that the whistle meant food. Um, I still remember exactly what parts of Tammy's body were gray and what parts were white and the sort of the actual feel of Tammy's fur when I petted her. And um, Tammy, I believe, broke her leg at one point when she was hit by a car, um, but did not die at that point. And I remember my mother taking me to see Tammy, visit Tammy, when she was recovering at the vet's. And Tammy was stuck in a tiny little cage. Um, And I remember feeling incredibly sorry for her. Maybe that's what sort of got me thinking about the tragedy of animals confined in spaces that are too small, which is a major theme of frog. Um, And But there was something else about Tammy that was sort of amazing, which was that Tammy gave birth. So Tammy must have been pregnant when she sort of sort of showed up at our back door. Um, Tammy gave birth and my mother, who always believed that it was okay to tell children about sex and okay to tell them about birth and death and okay for them to see oogie things, um, actually let us watch Tammy give birth. And I remember seeing the kittens come out. She was in a little bed my mother had made for her in the corner of our den and they their eyes were closed and they were covered with sort of yellow vaseline <laughs> stuff and I didn't know what it was um, but I'd been forewarned and it seemed slightly gross but also really miraculous um, and then I got to choose which um, kitten we would keep in addition to Tammy and it was a tuxedo kitten white and black um, named oh. Blackie um, probably good that I didn't choose one of Blackie's siblings because I named all of these kittens before we gave them away. And I named one of them Lovamataz. <laughs> and, you know, sort of here Lovamataz, here Lovamataz would have been a bit of a mouthful. But Tammy and Blackie, I will love them forever. Yeah. And I mean, you alluded to this just now, but Bunky, the pet frog you and your family cared for, for... 16 or maybe 17 years unclear was what you call a pet that chooses you. And he was, he was in kind of a, a slightly smaller than should be aquarium, which was on your kitchen counter. Um, and you kind of compare Bunky to the carnival goldfish and, and much of your essay centers on how passively your family cared for him as is often the case with this, these sorts of pets. So, when and how did it become important to you to write about Bunky and to give him this starring role in this piece? Yeah, well, I also write about an 
actual carnival yes. goldfish that our family <laughs> had, but for only, I think, yes. a day, maybe two days, um, named Rosebell, and uh, who actually had been won at a, a street fair, and our small daughter was just devastated when Rosebell died. And I remember had to, she was in a summer day camp and had to stay home because she was so extremely sad. She painted a beautiful picture of Rosebell that we still have. Um, and Rosebell, of course, you know, sort of retained her um, sainted role because she lived for only a day. Um, one of the amazing things about Bunky was also the problem about Bunky, which was that he was essentially immortal. <laughs> and a pet frog that might seem incredibly exciting on day one is a little less exciting after 16 years. Um, but in any case, when did it become important for me to write about Bunky? Well, I saved the folder in which I had, over a period of years, filed printouts of information on um, on what kinds of aquariums might be best for his species and how big they should be and what kind of filters they should be and what kind of toys they should have. And um, the very fact that I didn't toss that um, after he died shows that I was sort of Maybe maybe I just saved it as evidence of my guilt for never having gotten them the bigger aquarium. But maybe I sort of thought, well, someday I might write about this. Um, but I kept thinking about something that one of my students said that I quote in the essay. Um, it was at a lunch that I give for graduating seniors that my husband and I give at the end of every year. And one of them um, coming to our house in Western Massachusetts had walked past Bunky's aquarium and just stood for a moment and stared at Bunky and said, like, that's his life. Um, and those four words just, I couldn't forget them. In fact, I sent um, the essay to that former student whom I haven't seen for years, just because I really feel those four words kind of got inside my head and my soul. And I worried about them. And um, I assume you're a writer too, Violet. You know how writers work. Some of it is conscious and rational, but so much of it is unconscious. An idea just sort of gets inside and over a period of weeks or months, or in my case, years, just sort of rolls around, um, you know, in your unconscious or <laughs> somewhere who knows where. Uh and grows and transmutes and morphs, you know, sort of the way a tadpole um, morphs into a, a frog. And I can't say that there was one morning when I woke up and said, I got to write about Bunky. But I know that at a certain point, I started making some notes. And I didn't start writing the piece until at least a year after I'd started making notes. But I remember making notes on um, uh, the thoughts that I had had for example, when um, a mouse plopped out of the heavens, uh, a mouse <laughs> that is from Bunky's point of view, a mouse uh, somehow had gotten into our house and, and fallen into Bunky's aquarium. And my husband, George, found the mouse drowned in the morning and um, Bunky was swimming around the mouse. And clearly that had stuck with me. And I just sort of thought of some things I might want to say about that. So, um, you know... If you are writing on deadline, you just have to go with what's available to your conscious mind, your rationality. But if you are not writing on deadline and something can grow over a period of years, it's like a seed that you don't even know is planted. You don't quite know what kind of tree it's going to grow into, but over time it just does. I think what you just said about sort of a feeling that maybe you can't quite place your, your finger on or a feeling that's just sort of ambiently following you around you know, one of the big things about pet ownership is this fear that you touch on in the piece is that, am I treating this animal right? Am I giving it the best life possible? Or am I just giving it the life that is, you know, am basically like a, a sense of fairness to to even, mm -hmm. you know, like this unpettable pet. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. you know, aside from that, maybe that fear that maybe all 
pet owners have to a certain extent or like ones that aren't abusing their animals, let's say, uh, you know, what do you think it is about Bunky or your relationship with Bunky that makes him worthy of a subject of memoir? I mean, you, you, you spoke so beautifully about your cat, Tammy, but like what, you know, you don't, you, you're not writing about Typo, the dog, you're writing about Bunky. No, I didn't write an essay about Tammy and I didn't write an essay about Typo, um, who, you know, ha- makes a sort of cameo appearance in the um, essay uh, about Bunky. It's not that Bunky was more interesting than Typo. Um, typo was endlessly fascinating. And if you have, a, you know, the next five hours after we finish this podcast, I'd be happy to um, tell you all about Typo. I, I uh, truly could just go on forever. Um, but I, I've read a lot of things about dogs and I hadn't ever read anything um, I'm sure some stuff has been written, but I hadn't read anything about what I call unpettable pets. Um, and especially the kind of pet uh, that enters your family more or less by accident. Um, in this case, Bunky began as a coupon for a tadpole left under the Christmas tree by a grandmother. And we redeemed it a couple of years later when not the child for whom it was attend- intended, but the younger child um, noticed that the coupon had come with a kind of a plastic box that was supposed to hold the future tadpole and said, what is that? And of course, it didn't say what species it was. It was just an address. We, it was prepaid by the grandmother. We sent in the coupon. Um, you know, nobody said this is a, a, a kind of frog that will often um, live for more than a decade and has been known in some cases to live for more than 20 years. We just, it was really like the carnival goldfish. We sort of thought, oh, this would be kind of fun if it even makes it to frog stage, we'll be lucky. And then, you know, Henry will be sad, but he'll learn about death as as Susanna did. Um, So that I hadn't, and the kind of responsibilities that parents have to take care of the pets that they sort of inherit because their children have lost interest. Um, And you usually don't lose interest in a dog. You just love it more and more, and most family members do. So I hadn't read it before, and I love reading stuff that surprises me because I hadn't read it before. And so I love writing stuff that surprises me. And I thought it would be interesting, an interesting exercise to just see if I could get everything that could possibly be gotten out of my experience and feelings with this unpettable pet who was with our family for so long. Yes. And I think, you know, mentioning Typo, the dog, as you, as you say, you know, you, you only grow to love a pet like that more, whereas, because there's some sense of communication, right? Whereas with a pet like Bunky, or the uh, carnival goldfish, there's no real communication, right? There's, you know, even a, like some birds can talk. Like there's, there's, there's lots of different ways animals communicate with us, but with an amphibious pet, it's a bit more uh, esoteric, let's say, <laughs> or, or, or difficult to understand. So do you think communication is essential to caretaking or somehow influences it in ways that we maybe aren't we don't think about all the time it certainly does but i also think that not all pet owners are the same Mm -hmm. um maybe some pet owners are much less selfish than i am they don't need their pet to respond they don't need reciprocity they don't need their pet to recognize them and be happy when they come home they don't need their pet to jump up on their laps Um, and maybe pet owners who have less ego don't require communication Um, but for me to have a real relationship with a pet it needs to be a a two-way street well, what do you think those owners who, let's say, don't have that ego? What what do they, what do they, what do you think they loved about their African frogs? Like, what do they love about their frogs? Uh, if you could, if you could, put you know, transpose yourself. Yeah, some people really do love their frogs, and I quoted some things that truly loving owners of 
of African clawed frogs had said, um, you know, maybe people who are essentially better human beings than I am, they're going to get into heaven first because they really loved their African clawed frogs. Um, I mean, there was one named Maurice who has his own Facebook page that is still kept up and visited by various other uh, um, owners of African clawed frogs. And he lived um, a very long life and his birthday was celebrated every year and he keeps getting more followers as i remember that the the harper's fact checker this is the one thing that was going to be left open until the very day the essay closed like how many followers does maurice the grow a frog have and then there was another a british owner of this species of frog who said i'm gutted when um, her frog escaped its aquarium and she worried that it had died while trying to crawl across the dry carpeting since African clawed frogs are aquatic and they, they really stay in the water pretty much all the time. But anyway, what did they see about uh, seeing their frogs? I certainly, in the case of the, the owner of Maurice, I can't say, oh, well, it was because um, Maurice didn't live very long which is usually the essential quality of the unpettable pet, you know, it exits from your life conveniently before um, you stop being interested. But I mean, she had Maurice for even longer uh, than we had Bunky. Um, I think Maurice lived till his eight t- late twenties, if memory serves. And um, so uh, African clawed frogs are, they're weird they look like space aliens. I loved the photographs that um, <laughs> Harper's used because they were, they, you know, it's a species of frog that's so different from Kermit or like the frog and frog and toad. Uh, they're flat. They're weird. They have these sort of weird feet. They are, they're graceful. They sort of look like E.T. And so um, I can imagine a certain sort of person thinking this is beautiful. And one of the reasons it's beautiful is that it's as different as possible from me. That is mammals are the most like us mm. and the unpettable pets are the least like us. And someone who could appreciate the sort of ethereal, weird otherness of an African clawed frog, you know, might, um, have a lasting love. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, you know, part of the reason the strangeness comes from the fact that an African clawed frog is like a wild animal. It's not a domesticated pet. It's not uh, an image that appears in a storybook. It's not Mr. Toad. It's, it's, Bunky was a wild animal who happened to live with you. I mean, did writing this piece, you know, raise questions for you about whether owning wild animals are is always ethically a little complicated because of the nature of confinement and that's in connection possible connection? Yes, <laughs> in a word. Absolutely. I mean, of course, uh, Bunky his species was an African clawed frog. Though we were so incurious that um, we didn't know what his species was um, for many years. And then a student who was helping me file papers in my office walked past his aquarium one day in the kitchen and said, oh, you have a grow a frog. And I said, we have a what? A grow a frog. <laughs> and and I, a grow a frog, of course, isn't a species. It's a brand. <laughs> it's a brand. <laughs> and uh, we'd long forgotten the sort of brand on the coupon that we'd sent in. And um, uh, and it was only then that we learned what kind of frog Bunky was. And yes, it is originally a wild species, um, wild in Africa, um, also has been um, released in various other places by people who don't want to keep their pet African clawed frogs and it is a problematic invasive species. Um uh, but of course, for generations, these had been bred for sale as pet pets by the company that sells them. But just being bred for sale as pets doesn't mean that they've been bred for domestication like dogs. Um, and certainly some breeds of dogs in particular have been specifically bred um, to bond with humans. Of course, I have a really hard time 
thinking even about um, domesticated species like dogs living in confinement. Mm -hmm. Um, We didn't have uh, a dog when we lived in New York City. We now live in the country in Western Massachusetts. And over the years, we've had two dogs, the first of whom um, makes an appearance in Frog. Um, uh, But one of the reasons that we didn't have a dog in in New York City was that I was really troubled by the thought of dogs, especially dogs that uh, who weren't living with another companion dog, just a solo dog being left alone in a too small apartment without yeah. too many fun things to sniff while um, owners, you know, would be away uh, from home for very long hours. Um, and they would think, oh, my dog loves me so much. Well, of course the dog is going to act happy when they come home because that dog has been bored to tears. And if they don't pay for dog walker also, you know, really needs to pee when they walk back in the door and is also probably very hungry. Of course that dog is happy to see them. Even just talking about dogs in that situation makes me sad. Not that I think that city dogs can't be happy. And if people can afford a dog walker and are home for a lot of the time, I think city dogs can be really happy. And there's some very good owners of city dogs. But, um, I do think that any pet owner, uh, whether uh, you're owning um, a frog or a dog, needs to think about whether the life they're able to give that pet is worth living. And the life we gave Bunky was really long. We were very (laughs) good owners in a way. We satisfied every minimum requirement uh, for keeping him alive. We had frog sitters when we would go away. Uh, we gave him everything he needed to live a very long life. But at least in retrospect, I don't feel that we gave him what he needed to have a life that was worth living. And even just saying those words makes me really, really sad. And I should warn the readers of this essay when they begin, they think it might be a uh, funny essay, and I hope parts of it are, but it ends up quite a sad one at the end, and it's the sadness that sticks with me and that I feel in my throat, even now as I talk about Bunky's life. Yeah, I mean, because even if you didn't necessarily love Bunky, there is that that sense of responsibility and that sense of this is another living creature that I must protect that comes with all pets you know or all living creatures if you you know sort of have a respect for life but you know it's hard it's hard not to when it's like a little creature right but it it seems maybe dangerous to write about pets for reasons entirely unrelated to why it's dangerous to write about humans because you know the uncommunicativeness would mean that there's no possibility of legal trouble, you know, but there, but writing about pets does seem potentially sentimental, which is something that you avoid here. You get at you, like you say, you definitely get at this like really hard truth. That's like hard for you to, to process and kind of remains unresolved, but you know, it's not, it's nothing about this is sentimental. So how did you avoid, you know, that sentimentality or, you know, or does avoiding sentimentality come to you naturally? Mm, Well, if I had written 6,000 words on, on our dog typo, um, (laughs) every one of them would have been sentimental. And, and indeed I was deliberately sentimental in the section that was about typo. So we would see the contrast. Mm -hmm. I put in all of his nicknames and I said, he was the softest dog we'd ever petted. And he was also a genius, you know, took him only 20 minutes to learn how to use his dog door. (laughs) Um, And when we would come back home, you know, even if we'd just gone out to the supermarket for 15 minutes, it was like the end of a world war two movie where the (laughs) lovers, you know, reunite on the train platform. I mean, um, all my feelings about typo, I guess, have both sentiment and sentimentality. And I do think that there's a difference between the two. Yes. Sentiment is emotion, and that's a good thing. And sentimentality is uh, generic emotion, the sort of hallmark card version. Um, uh, I remember that Franny and Zoe Salinger 
um, has one of his characters quote some British writer, I don't remember who, but who defined uh, sentimentality as having more tenderness for something than God has. Mm -hmm. That's a great um, definition. And then this, uh, I think that the character goes on to say something like God loves kittens, but not, not um, kittens with, you know, cute little colored booties. <laughs> um, and that's really a good, you know, God loving kittens, that sentiment, uh, the kittens that have the little, you know, extra booties put on for the picture or the cartoon, that sentimentality. Um, well, uh, I mean, it seems to me that uh, frogs would, they're inherently a less sentimental subject. Most people haven't had frogs. And sentimentality is a way of generically pressing a little button in your reader or your listener, your <laughs> watcher, that makes that person go, ah, because uh, it's, it, it will, it will extend a web to all kinds of other images and feelings that are virtually identical that that, um, reader has either experienced or seen over the course of their life. And with a frog, there are zero buttons of that sort. Um, and also, uh, Bunky was kind of oogie, you know, he was really, he was f covered with gelatinous goo and you, you had to pick him up, uh, when you cleaned his, um, aquarium, I should say, uh, you, I don't really mean either you or I, because I really mean my husband who was always the one who cleaned Bunky's aquarium. I had been responsible for cleaning the complex apparatus of our daughters, um, a, a, a hamster, Silky, who had sort of two different kind of terraria and there are various <laughs> tubes connecting them and they were really hard to clean too. And that had been my job, but George cleaned uh, Bunky's aquarium and, um, you know, the aquarium was oogie, the water was oogie, uh, he was oogie and I didn't mind his oogie-ness. My brother and I had had a, a, a pet um, snake uh, when I was in my early teens, a gopher snake that we had for a few months and then released. Um, and we released him both because we thought he belonged in the wild and he'd be happier there. But he had a large space because we had, we, our parents let us fill, I sort of can't even believe this to this day, the fl of floor of an entire spare bathroom um, uh, with dirt. And so the gopher snake uh, had the sort of whole bathroom, although escaped once and was found uh, in the dishwasher because her mother had partially <laughs> propped it open while it was still warm to help dry the dishes. And the snake, you know, um, uh, had uh, immediately been able to home in on the warmth, um, uh, you know, like a heat-seeking missile. Um <laughs> But it's also possible that we recognize that the snake every week was becoming less exciting mm. and therefore um, that releasing the snake was the right thing to do. Um, but uh, uh, Bunky's oogie-ness didn't repel me exactly, but it definitely made it more easy to write about Bunky in an unsentimental way. But I also, I think, was deliberately trying to, because a lot of this is about, you know, small children and pets, and that's inherently, you know, it's like water going downhill. The gravitational force is just sort of going to start sliding down inevitably towards sentimentality unless you build a few dams. <laughs> um, so um, I'll, it, may I digress briefly? Oh, please. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, this is a uh, maple sugar stirring season um, in Western Massachusetts where I live, and we make our own maple syrup. But before we, uh, we made our maple syrup, um, and this is a story I always tell my writing students. I, I'm a writing teacher. Um, uh, the fr when we moved here from New York 23 years ago. And the, the first time we went to a sugar house, you know, in a barn on a farm, and I sat down on a, you know, bench, 
to have some pancakes and the, the stranger was sitting next to me who ordered sugar on snow, which is super dense syrup that's sort of drizzled on top of snow that you scoop up from behind the barn and, and it, it sort of hardens into a delicious it's kind of a lattice. Um, and on the a plate right next to um, this was a pickle. And, you know, it's like nine o'clock in the morning. And I said, excuse me, um, why do you, why is there a pickle? It was like having, first of all, weird at that hour and weird uh, because it's like having a pickle next to a bowl of vanilla ice cream. Right. <laughs> and I said, why could you, you know, here we were like the the urban rubes who didn't know anything about country life. Why is there a pickle? And she said, oh, it's a tradition. The pickle, it almost always, sugar and snow always has a pickle. The pickle cuts the sweetness. So the pickle cuts the sweetness. And so I tell my students, if something is in danger of becoming too sweet, you know, you got to deploy some pickles. Yes. And those could be humor. They could be irony. They could be either restraint or hyperbole, either sort of less than you expect or more than you expect rather than going right down the middle. A surprise, either in phrasing or in terms of plot. Um, but most important, really, 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 really specific details so that only you could write what you are writing and nobody else could. And then it can't be the Hallmark card or the Lifetime TV um, feature with the soft violins. It just can't be. Um, so if I tell my student to do that stuff, you know, I better practice what I preach. And I tried to do it in Frog. Well, I want to go back to that, the pickle of this, right? Which is, as you said before, kind of the ending where it's the what made Bunky such a perplexing, or unlike the snake, let's say, you couldn't let Bunky out, right? You if you if you released him into the wild, he probably would have died, or it would have been bad for the environment. So he was yep. confined, which made his like the tragedy of him all the the greater <laughs> you know because yep. it's like there's there's no right way of dealing with his existence except to just sort of keep going in this way that feels kind of wrong or am i or am i getting this am i misreading this no, you're reading it exactly right except for one thing there's no right way but there would be would have been better or worse ways. Mm -hmm. um, some African clawed frogs are kept in even smaller aquariums than the one that we had them in. Um, but we could have gotten a bigger one and we never did. And that really would have been my responsibility because I said I was going to research it and I did. And I got so involved with the you know, this is how procrastinators of a certain sort procrastinate. They over-cerebrate. And, oh, my God, what kind of filter? We need a filter. We didn't need a filter for the little one, but little aquarium, but we need one for a big one. What kind of filter? Oh, this one is supposed to be good. Oh, I've read here in this, you know, frog form. It's really loud, and it's always been quiet for Bunky. You know, maybe it would be too loud, and he hated, and we'd think we were making his life better, but maybe we'd be torturing him. And then, you know, should we do this? Should we do that? Should we have an under-sand filter? Well, sand would be nice. Oh, Oh, no, sand isn't nice. Here, here's a form that says that, you know, one f frog swallowed sand and he brought to the vet and like have surgery. And, you know, I, I was just completely paralyzed, paralyzed until all of a sudden it was too late and Bunky died. So, yes, there is no really good way, I think, to have a captive pet of this sort, but there are definitely better ways and worse ways and um, our um, way was not the best way. And I still feel uh, guilty about it, which of course is one of the ways, one of the reasons this piece isn't sentimental because really the dominant emotions of the last third of the piece are guilt and shame. And um, those are sort of enemies of cliche. It's hard to write about something you're ashamed of using cliches so it's easy to avoid them so you know at the end of the piece you're writing about Bunky's death and that after he died you and your husband kept him in your freezer for six years before you arranged 
his memorial service because you felt as though your children should be there, but then eventually you realize that your children actually didn't need to attend. So how I have to, you know, how often were you conscious of his presence in your freezer? <laughs> Because <laughs> like, you yeah, mentioned he's like behind the tamales, but <laughs> yeah. Well, at first he was in this weird little shelf, and I remember, uh, and, and until our refrigerator died and we got a new refrigerator, but um, you know, very assiduously, I found the exact model of our old KitchenAid refrigerator and, <laughs> and uh, sent a photograph of it to the fact checker. And you know, here is the the weird little shelf that doesn't look as if it would be big enough to hold anything, but obviously was made for a frog. In That's fact, true. an African clawed frog because <laughs> Bunky was so much so flat compared to most frogs. Um, and then after a few years, the fridge died, and then uh, he was moved. I think to the second shelf from the bottom or, I mean, you know, he was behind the frozen tamales and we couldn't really see him. And so we'd go for months or maybe years without ever remembering he was in there. But then, um, you know, we'd move a tamale or <laughs> something would remind us. Um, our children were grown. They were living away from home. They always came home for Christmas, but then the, the, um, earth uh was too hard to dig so we couldn't dig a grave for bunky he couldn't join the kind of family pet cemetery where henry's uh, uh guinea pigs biscuit and bean um had been laid to rest and ultimately we just realized this is ridiculous our children don't care all that much about bunky um but we never would have thrown him out ever 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 we did bury him and it was really sad burying him and the piece ends with that scene which still makes me uh sad to think about and i i told monkey i was sorry yeah. um yeah. and that's how the how the piece ends and i still feel sorry i mean do you feel like you know you're talking about how you were kind of paralyzed by research um and <laughs> you know obviously that's that's a uh, product of the internet but even before the internet let's say you could have fallen down these different rabbit holes like do you feel like that that research was not just a form of procrastination but perhaps a way of dealing with uh this the situation that you found yourself in that it's like well this is fundamentally impossible there's there there are limitations to the way i'm doing it and so just just witnessing those was enough to be like well you know i i can't I, this is this is the best I can do. Yeah, I don't think I realized it at the time, but I think that's a great insight. Um, and of course, uh, if I'd finally bit the bullet and said to myself, the perfect is the enemy of the good, I'm just going to buy a, a bigger aquarium and throw a dart and get, you know, a filter and it won't be perfect, but it'll be a damn sight better than what Bunky has now that I would have known that that was the last aquarium Bunky would have. Mm. And uh, as long as I didn't buy one, I could still have this fantasy that I was going to get one that was really the perfect one. And of course that never happened. But yes, I do think that um, uh, your insight on why I procrastinated um, has a lot of truth to it. Hate to admit it, but you are right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the idea of the last aquarium, you know, that raises the question of death, obviously, you know, the final, the final, uh, you know, that there would not be another, that you would, you would purchase this thing and then he would live there until he died. And that's what happened. Right. So, you know, you've, you've written about death before quite a bit, actually, you know, for the New Yorker, for us, you wrote uh, this really interesting piece of call about um, this, euthanasia organizations publication ceasing to exist i mean you know it's it's death is something that everyone experiences and writing about it coherently and again without cliche or let's say sentimentality is a rare skill i mean has writing about death broadened your understanding of it or perhaps refined the way in which you process it huh <laughs> well yeah i've actually come to think of it, written about death even more than in the two things that you mentioned. Um, I, way back in the 80s, I wrote a piece in my first job at Life magazine about um, 
an elderly couple, both terminally ill, who committed a double suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, and that got me interested in the newsletter of the Hemlock Society, which I wrote about for Harper's. And then, as you mentioned, I wrote an essay about, um, it was about called Underwater, about um, being on a canoe trip and seeing somebody drown. Um, but uh, in uh, my most recent book, which is a, a memoir about my father called The Wine Lover's Daughter, my father dies at the end and there's an actual sort of death scene. And now here's the death of a frog. Um, you know, I, I hope there's no um, necrophilia thing going on uh, for me. Uh, uh, I, I, but I'm not sure writing about death has made me understand it better, but it's made me look at it from different angles. Um, you know, who knows what Freud would say about why I've written about death so much. I don't think it has as much to do with my hope that it'll help me understand death better um, as uh, it is simply that death is really interesting. Um, death is hard to face. And so it's interesting to face. Um, it's, it's a literary challenge. Mm. Um And not all deaths are the same. The death of of your beloved father is really different um, from the death of a frog. Um, But uh, (laughs) either way, when you get to that death scene or when you're writing about the mourning rituals that follow a death, um, you're really paying attention. You're wide awake when you write those sentences. And I want to write sentences that force me to be wide awake. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've mentioned that, you know, you're, you're a professor and you've, you, writ, you wrote something else for Harper's about, you know, sort of the lessons you learned from your students and sort of coming into terms with uh, the, you know, pronouns and using their as a pronoun, they, them as a pronoun a, instead of, you know, um, his or her. And that, I mean, that essay, I think is really wonderful because you're coming, you don't, you, you say that I'm not somebody who has like this ideological opposition to it just grammatically here is how I came to terms with it It it's very funny I mean do you do you feel like because I've heard the expression death or grief is the best teacher and do you feel like your your attempts to write about death is is perhaps an extension of your work as a teacher to kind of like Mm. help a greater understanding of not just why it's fascinating but you know how to how to look at in a way that's not so um terrifying or not so sentimental or not so cliche yeah people uh, you know it's like uh eulogies in which um all the nubbins are rubbed off the character of the person who's died so they are completely devoid of personality because you can say only nice things right everybody's supposed to dress alike for funerals and so on death makes everybody conform Mm -hmm. um and i'm not interested in conformity i'm interested in non-conformity um i am interested in writing about things um that will be new for me and perhaps new for the readers or writing them in a new way uh so um maybe it, it these things have something to teach readers, but I think mainly I chose them because they might have something to teach me or something to teach me about writing or how to write about things that are difficult to write about. Why write about something that's easy to write about? You know, right. I'm, I'm, I'm 69 now. And how am I going to give myself challenges that are different from what I've I've um, written before. Um, I don't just want to keep on writing stuff that I already know I can write well. So this piece was written in a slightly different format. It's a segmented essay. It's not a straight narrative. Um, it, 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 it provided a bunch of challenges for me. And I think that that's what I look for in writing so yes some teaching was involved but I was the main student Mm -hmm. and I I, you know obviously this this piece brings many things to mind and um what have have you gotten any responses to this story that have been you know speaking of writing what what have people written to you about this (laughs) I have 
Uh, it's pretty easy to find my email address at Yale. So readers do often find it and write me. And mm. I, I keep thinking, gee, I wish you'd also write Harper's. You know, <laughs> if only Harper's knew how many emails there were. But I, 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 I love getting these emails. And people have written me, of course, about their deceased animals, their dead goldfish and hamsters and rabbits and so on. And I love the idea that I wrote something that made people think about their own pets and their relationships with their own pets. But um, one reader um, who, uh, <laughs> I guess that he had particularly noticed an absolutely ridiculous uh, song that I had written that I used to sing to our dog Typo, the point being that I never made up a song that I sang to Bunky, um, but I would sing to Typo. And he sent me, this reader sent me the lyrics to a song that he had written for his uh, rescue chihuahua, whose name was Arthur P. Dogular III. And there was a line that uh, described Arthur P. Dogular, I think, as being somewhere between a doggy and a bird. And that is just a much better line than anything in the song that I used to sing to Typo. It, but you know, I love the idea uh, that this touched some sort of nerve um, because people's relationships with their pets are just usually written about in the most expectable way. You can just predict every single line. Um, but it's not that I'm a particularly original writer, but you have to be original if you're writing 6,000 words about a pet frog because you have no models. Yes. Um, anyway, maybe that's what readers have responded to. So I have then I've had several emails back and forth with the owner of Arthur P. Dogular the third. Yeah, Chihuahua. I feel like a lot of Chihuahuas are bird-like, but I'm sure Arthur was Arthur bird-like in his own way. Arthur extra, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This was such, it was so wonderful speaking to you about this amazing essay. Well, thank you so much. I have thoroughly enjoyed this, Violet, and thank you for reading it with such care and also for being interested in Bunky because <laughs> uh, I think I really did write this essay as a form of atonement. Mm. It didn't help Bunky in the least. It would have been better if I'd been nicer to Bunky while he was alive. Um, but he's not alive. And at least I could honor him in death. And thank you for helping me to do so. You've been listening to the Harper's Magazine podcast, produced by Violet Luca and Madeline Crum, with production assistance by Ian Montgani. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. Harper's Magazine is the oldest general interest monthly in America, exploring the issues that drive our national conversation through long-form narrative journalism and essays. To get 12 issues for $21.97, visit harpers.org save.